Hey, I don't know if you've, uh, if you've ever seen the TV series Forged in Fire, where, they t- where the master metalsmith takes metal from different sources, right? Some of it's just raw ore that needs to be purified. Sometimes it's, it's, it's old pieces that are even maybe a little broken down, and, 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 and some of it is misshaped or, or damaged metal. And then they use the fire to cleanse it and to reshape it into something useful. And, and that's just like the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. In fact, for this series, our theme verse is uh, Matthew 3, 11, and it says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, this is John the Baptist, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, he's talking about Jesus, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You know, I was thinking this week, when we talk about spiritual gifts, because that's what our series is about, right? We're talking about spiritual gifts. When we talk about spiritual gifts, what, what exactly are we doing? When we talk about it, we, we, we focus in it in our connect groups, what, what are we doing? And, and I thought about this, Psalms 143.10 where the psalmist writes these words. Because I think, it's a, I think it's a part of what we're doing through this series. The psalmist writes, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. I think that's what's happening in a series like this. When we talk about uh, spiritual gifts, because of how personal it is, of what the Holy Spirit's doing in our hearts and, and how he's formed us and, and how he calls for us to be a part of something way bigger than ourselves. I mean, some things that we're, we're, we're doing is we're not assuming. We're not making assumptions that we know uh, what it is that God wants us to do without consulting him. Uh, we are believing that our creator has designed us to live for his purposes so, so if we do that, we're, we're going to ask him. We're going to ask God to show us and to, and to teach us and to instruct us. And, and then we're going to listen and expect the Holy Spirit to lead us. So, so that's why in a, in a series like this, that's why it's so important for the applicable, application part of it that, that, we're, that man, we're involved in group life where we're, where we're where we're examining ourselves through different levels of assessments and wise counsel to find our passion and to find our talents and to, and to find our giftedness. And I love the end of the verse where it says, may your good spirit lead me on level ground. You know what I like about that? When something is level, it's ready to be built upon. So like when the scripture says, hey, Lord, you teach me and you guide me. Because until we accept his teaching and until we accept his guidance, until we allow the Holy Spirit like, like to form us and we recognize that and we embrace it, we're not level ground. But man, when we do, we become level ground. And once we become level ground, then we are like we're ready to be built upon. The structure is no longer shaky. The foundation is, is solid. And, and, and so as we kick off into, into the message that we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna teach tonight, let, let's pray for those things. Let's pray. Let's be humble and say, Lord, teach me. I don't want to assume something. I don't just want to blow something off because of what I think I know. or what I, I want your Holy Spirit to instruct me and guide me. So let's say a word of prayer. Jesus, thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Lord, how good it is to know that that you have sent your spirit to live within us, to burn up the chaff, right? You've sent your spirit to to mold us and to make us. You've sent your spirit to to, to, to gift us and and you sent your your, your spirit to to, to bring into our lives your fruit. And, And so, Lord, work in us and find us humble to hear what it is that you have to say. Lord, Teach us and help us to be humble, to be obedient to your calling in our lives. We love you, Jesus. Work in us in great and powerful ways. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. So tonight, our topic, our topic tonight is is the most beneficial culture for spiritual gifts. So what we're going to talk about tonight is we're going to talk about what needs to happen 
You know, what, what sort of culture, what climate does, does the gifts of the Spirit, uh, what sort of culture climate does the gift of the Spirit most uh, mo function the best in? So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and we're just going to touch on 12 and 14 because the meat of what we want to talk about is in 1 Corinthians 13. But, but you know, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it is, it is the largest section of teaching about spiritual gifts in the scripture. Okay, starts off in chapter 12, and chapter 12, the apostle Paul is talking to us about the practical application of spiritual gifts. We go into chapter 13, which is where we're going to live most of tonight. It teaches us about the prompting of the gifts, like, 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 like the climate and the culture and the, and the motivation of the gifts. And then we go to chapter 14, and it teaches us the purpose of the gifts. So, so, so chapter 12, it, it teaches us some practical things about the gifts. Chapter 13 talks about the climate that the gifts need to exist in. And then chapter 14 talks to us about the purpose of the gifts. So at the end of chapter 12, after Paul addresses the practices of the gifts, you know, the practical side, where he talks about, hey, you know, you have gifts that come from the Holy Spirit in your life. Each believer has at least one of these gifts. We're supposed to embrace these gifts of ours and embrace the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to others. And we're supposed to celebrate the diversity of the gifts. And as we do that, we become unified and productive. So as Paul's talking about this in chapter 12, chapter 12 draws to a conclusion with these words. And I want you to hear this because this is really important to understand the climate and the culture of spiritual gifts. He closes the chapter in verse 31 with these words. Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. The most excellent way to start in chapter 13, it, 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 it is this. Listen to this. You're familiar with this passage of Scripture. Normally not in this context, right? But you're very familiar with this passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the hardship that, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, anybody take, want to take a wild shot and tell me what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is called? I mean, we know it, don't we? It's called the love chapter. Obviously, I mean, it's right. Love, 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 love. This is what love does. This is how love works. Love, 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 love. Is it interesting at all to you that this is the number one chapter of Scripture used at weddings? No competition. Hands down. 1 Corinthians 13, right? I mean, most of us, right, because we hear it all the time in the wedding context, we believe that, hey, this is, a, this is a chapter that's about marriage. But does it shock you to find out that this chapter is not about marriage at all? I mean, that's the truth. This chapter isn't about marriage. It's not about romantic love. It's not about how to get along with your spouse. Now, I do want to say this. It's not bad advice, right? It's not bad advice for any relationship that you're involved in. Right? It's, it's great advice and, and the impact of love and, and how that works. But is it, is it shocking to you that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is written on purpose and specifically to the church about the way they're supposed to handle spiritual gifts? Is that shocking? In fact, I, I think this, and, 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 and forgive me for this because I've used 1 Corinthians 13 in an awful lot of weddings, right? I've done a lot of weddings, and I've used 1 Corinthians 13. 
But I almost think, man, if I was the devil and I really wanted to distract people from using the gifts God gave them in the proper climate and culture, I would take the idea of that climate and culture and make it about something else totally so they didn't make the connection for the climate and culture for gifts to expand and grow. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the practices of the gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 talks about the purposes of the gifts. And right in between the practices of the gifts and the purposes of the gifts, smack in between the two is a chapter on love. Hey, let me tell you about gifts. You better love each other. This is why God gave us gifts. Hey, let me tell you about about the details of gifts. You better love each other. Hey, here is what gifts is supposed to produce in your life. Hey, let me tell you about how uh, different gifts work and how we're supposed to how we're supposed to unite through them. You better love each other. Uh, this is w- where God's gifts are taking you. Do so you ever wonder why why in the middle of talking about gifts, like how the Holy Spirit equips us, how He has made us? Do you ever wonder why in the middle of talking about gifts that the most famous chapter about love appears. And this is the most famous chapter about love. You know, I, I have some thoughts on this. Like, like one of my thoughts is, is that, you know, the, the, the love chapter shows up in between gifts, love, gifts. I, I think it shows up there because, because God's gifts, the Holy Spirit's gifts to us are so incredibly powerful and so incredibly powerful when we live into them. You see, gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. Think about, think about this. Gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity, right? The same Spirit that floated over the waters during creation. Man is the Spirit that gives you gifts. The same Spirit that, 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 that God breathed into Adam and Eve and brought them to life is the Spirit that gives you gifts. The same Spirit that God breathed over the Valley of Dry Bones in and, and, and Ezekiel's vision and they came back to life again. Right, That same Spirit is the Spirit that gifts you. In Romans 8.11 it says, The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in you and equips you. I mean, man, that's powerful. The same spirit that came on the earth at Pentecost and and lit the world on fire is the same spirit that equips you and prepares you and forms you. Man, the power of spiritual gifts are, are, are to be received and they're to be released in the context of love. I mean, man, they are so incredibly powerful. And when done in love, they become exponentially powerful. Man, when there's a culture and there's a climate of love, right, and people love each other and you care about each other and and you serve each other and you value each other, right, and you're not getting hung up on this and that and this and the other thing, right, because one thing the love chapter says is that love covers over a multitude of wrongs. I mean, man, when you're gracious and loving and you're kind, and then at the same time, man, you're, you're recognizing that the Holy Spirit has gifted you and that he's formed you and equipped you to function a certain way, and people are celebrating that in you? Man, that is powerful. It's like being supercharged. It's like drinking three five-hour energies in like 10 minutes. You got more energy than you know what to do with. It's like carbon up before a workout, right? You're carbon up and you go, man, I'm gonna, I need this energy. I'm going to burn it all up. How powerful are these gifts? You know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul talks about how powerful these gifts are. And this is what he says about these gifts. According to 1 Corinthians 14, when these gifts are in their proper culture, right, which is this culture and this climate of love, he says they do a few things for us. One thing they do for us as a church is that it edifies the church. You know, it, it improves the church. The church is better. You individually are better. You're uplifted. You're enlightened, right? They, man, in the culture and the climate of love, when 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 these gifts are 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 used, man, it's it's it's, it improves us. It uplifts us. It enlightens us. And these gifts also, it says, will bring unity and peace to the church. Now think about that. Unity and peace. Where does that come from? 
where we operate with a single mind and a single heart. Now, now hear me, we're not clones of each other, right? I mean, because we all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. We all have different talents. We, you know, we're not clones of each other. You know, we're not going to look the same. I mean, unless you're my son and then you, you know, you can look the same because of, you know, the gene pool. But, but I mean, we're not going to look the same. We're, we're not going to act the same. We're not going to like the same foods. We're, we're not going to like the same music. We're not going to wear the same clothes, right? Our styles are going to be different, right? Our personalities are going to be different. But all of that's going to be driven by the same mind and the same heart. Like there's a, this supernatural alignment that takes place. Like, like part of having one heart and one mind is, is the reality that the, that the obstacles, the internal obstacles of the church are removed. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. The internal obstacles of the church. I mean, you know, you know who always stops the church, right? You know who makes the church ineffective? You know what makes the church not productive? I mean, you know this. It's not the culture. Hollywood does not make the church more effective or less effective. It's not the culture around us. It's not the government. It's not the politicians. The politicians don't make us more, more effective or less effective. Even though it seems like so many inside the church get wrapped so much up in that, right? Whether it be the government or, 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 or politicians or whether it be the culture or whatever it is, they, they're nothing in comparison to the church, right? You, you know what Jesus said about the church? Jesus said, even the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The gates of hell. So, I mean, man, I mean, when you're looking and going, oh, man, you know, it's so hard in the culture nowadays. You know what they said? Oh, that's so damaging to us as Christians. We're losing all of our freedoms. And, man, it's just not. The culture never stops us. I mean, Jesus says the gates of hell can't stop you. When, when you function as the church. I mean, I mean man, 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 it's not some politician or some government policy that stops the church. I mean, no matter how much we whine and cry about it, that doesn't make the church any less effective. I mean, I mean right, the gates of hell can't prevail against the church. That's how powerful the Holy Spirit has equipped us and gifted us to function and man, in combination with, with this climate and culture of loving each other, man, it becomes, it, it, it's like exponentially explosive. And, and then, right, 1 Corinthians 14, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 says, when the gifts are placed in their proper context and purpose, the body of Christ, the church, moves as one. They move as one how powerful that is when we move as one? I mean, honestly, let, let me ask you this. And, and all your, right, I mean, I don't know if we would count up all the collective years that we've spent in church together. I mean, I would guess, you know, we've got a lot of collective years in church here. I, I would guess we do. I mean, right here, right, just with me, we've got 53 years in church. Soon to be 54. I know, it's hard to believe. I get it. But, but I mean, I've got 54, right? And some of you got more. Some of you got a little less. But if we would just add up how many collective years we have engaged in church, my goodness, how many years we have wrapped up in church. And, and, and you know how powerful it is if we move as one? But rarely have any of us seen the church function that way. A am I telling the truth? I mean, I'm telling the truth. We don't see the church function as one. We don't see the church moving in, in, in rhythm together as a body. I mean, man, we see, we see the body oftentimes in conflict with each other and would struggle with each other and, and holding out, right? And you know, I'm not going to participate, so you got, got a dead arm I've got to carry around or, or I've got a lame foot I've got to drag around behind me or I've got, and, and that's most of the time the church in which we function in, right? And somehow in spite of that, in spite of that, God still blesses us in incredibly powerful ways. 
But, but can you think about a time that you saw the church in all of its might and power? I mean, you know, one place we could say, right? I mean, you might be able in your life to say, hey, man, I'll tell you, man, this church, they are. And then it doesn't take long to pretty soon we're poking all sorts of holes in it, isn't it? Right? But I mean, can, can you think, hey, where, where have we seen the church? Well, one place we've seen it, at least we've read about it, is in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And this is how it describes that church that was full of the Holy Spirit and with power. Right? It says they devoted themselves to five things. So listen to this. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So, right, they, they were coming together saying, we want to be taught. We want to be taught. We're not coming in saying, hey, we know, we know, teach us. We want to learn. We want to grow. And to fellowship. So they were building purposeful, intentional relationships with each other, right? They devoted themselves to it. And to the breaking of bread, right? They, they, right? If you could define that as communion if you want to, or you define that as, hey, we get together and we, 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 we sup together, we eat together, we end a prayer. There's four things. Now look at the results. There's a fifth one yet to come, but look at the results. I mean, they're downright scary. The results of what happens to a devoted body of Christ that commits themselves to these things, it says, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. Everybody was filled with awe and they were filled with wonder. I mean, you, you know, if, if you could somehow, you know, jump in a time machine and go back to, to the early church in Acts chapter 2, that would be the place to be. In Jerusalem, man, the church was the place to be. Look how they responded. I mean, they did crazy stuff, right? They sold their property and possessions and gave to anyone who had need. Wow. I mean, that's, right, that's crazy stuff. And it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They loved being together. Man, they loved it so much, it was their top priority. Nothing was going to get in the way of them meeting together. Every day they met together. And then it says they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Man, they loved what was happening so much when they gathered, they wanted to take it home with them. So, right, they're like, yo, I don't want this to end. Come home with me. You know, I get it. It's, it's, it's 8 o'clock. Service is supposed to end. Come home. I'm going to be up till 11 or 11.30. Let's not end this yet. Right, there's this level of love. And then it says praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Is that, that, right? This is incredible stuff. Everybody liked them. But here comes the biggie. Here comes number five, right? Here comes the biggie. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Because they functioned as the church. Right? They, they, man, full of the Holy Spirit and full of power and and man, they functioned as the church, and, 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 and people began to believe because of that. You, you know what's happening in, in Acts 2? It's not the culture that's impacting the church. It's the church that's impacting the culture. I mean, the church is turning the world upside down. Do you know how powerful the gifts are when we're saved and released in love? Man, they move us to accomplish God's will reconciling a broken world and broken people to him. And, and in fact, the gifts are so powerful that they fall under constant attack by the enemy. Let's just talk about two or three ways in which they're attacked, in which the enemy attacks them. One way the enemy attacks the, the gifts is through pride, right? It's when somebody decides they're better and their gifts are more important and more valuable than the next person. And that pride creates dissension and they get filled up with pride and they, they can't receive counsel, they can't receive instruction, they can't receive insight, they can't receive healing, right? Because, it's, because the pride issue enters, right? I mean, another way that, 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 that gifts are attacked is through envy, you know? Why do they get to? Why do they have this? Why are they always leading? Well, you know, actually leading is a gift, but why are they always, how, why do people always follow them and not follow me, right? I mean, what's going on? Right? Well, maybe it's because the Holy Spirit gifted somebody with a gift. Right? And people are drawn to them because of the gift that the Holy Spirit gave them. Right? There's this idea of, of envy that attacks. Fear attacks the gifts. Our, man, how many times 
How many times have you said, I don't know, maybe you've, maybe you've, heard, maybe you've heard something like the live vision moment, right? And, and Brad says something like, man, you ought to be connected. I'm going to tell you, it's a sacrifice, but you ought to be connected. He, he leads a, he's been leading a, a small group of teenagers, uh, you know, through the youth group for the last four years, right? Heavily involved in that every Sunday night, you know, coming out and participating in the lives of teenagers, trying to mold them, teach them God's word, be there for them, be a part of their lives, right? Be available to them. But how many times have you heard something like that where you've been challenged and you've said to yourself, you know, I ought to do that. And immediately, what does the evil one start to whisper in your ear? You can't do that. You can't do that. No wonder he does it. He's the pastor's kid. I mean, you can't do that. I mean, you, you know, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not. And, and, and you know what I think? Right, 99% of the battle is just showing up. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, when you have a hardship in life and, and, and something happens to you and the world caves, caves in around you, right? When all of that happens to you, who do you appreciate? The person who shows up, right? You're not expecting them to deliver some great answer to you. You're not expecting them to take the tragedy away. You're not expecting them to, 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 to change everything that's just happened in your life. But man, when they show up, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, that's big. Right? That's 99% of the battle. I'm just going to show up, right? And, and you know, the first time I walk into that room with these teenagers, my knees may knock and they may hear it, but, but by the 10th time, I'm going to be an old pro at this. I mean, don't let the devil discourage you and attack the way that God has designed you. Don't do it. I mean, I could go on and on and on, right, in the way that, the, way that the, the, the gifts are attacked because they're so incredibly powerful in our own lives, in the life of the church. That's why Paul says in the middle of talking about gifts, I want to show you the most excellent way. Love is the antidote to every attack. Did you hear that? Love is the antidote to every attack. I mean, even when the devil attacks you and tells you you can't, Man, you, you, love helps you over that. Love helps you through that. The love of others, the, the, the love of, 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 of God, the, the, the love of how God designs you and the acceptance of that. And, and in fact, you know how, you know the most excellent way when we talk about love? Th this is how excellent it is. In the first seven verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, this is what basically the Apostle Paul says. All of this, all of this, all of this, all of this doesn't matter at all without love. None of it matters. Man, if we're not going to connect together and if we're not going to like, like share grace with each other and if we're not going to like, man, the music, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it really doesn't matter if, if there's not love. The preaching, it doesn't matter. If there's no love. Giving, it doesn't matter if there's no love. The gifts, which he's talking about specifically here, right? Chapter 12, practical side. Chapter 14, the, 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 you know, the, the, the purpose of them. Man, they mean nothing without love. But put in their proper context. My goodness. My goodness. So, so what does love do? Follow me here. What does love do? So the scripture says, and all these are verses, right? I'm just going to attach them together for us for a moment. So the scripture says, God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave. We love because he first loved us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. So, so, like, why, why is love in the middle of these chapters on gifts? I, I, right, three, three answers. Love creates the proper climate for gifts to be received and gifts to be released. Man, if there's not love, nobody's going to release their gifts. Love points gifts to God's purpose, to the Great Commission, to see people believe. And then here's the final one. Love motivates us to say yes to God. So, you know, I'm, I'm proud of Brad that Brad came, comes up and 
you know, Brad's story is right. We have a shared story. And his younger brother has a shared story. And that's that the greatest tragedy in our lives is that their oldest brother took his own life. Right? We're, we're my goodness, we're two and a half years out from that now in our journey. And I'm so proud that, that it didn't shatter their faith. Right? That they didn't say, God, how could you do this? I'm done. They didn't do that. They didn't run away. They pressed in, right, to who God is in their lives. Well, you know, you know what we did last weekend? I wasn't here last weekend. Carlos was here. Wasn't he great? Carlos is, man, Carlos is fantastic. We worked with him in Panama. We worked with him in the Dominican. You know, Grace did a great job translating Saturday night. So thank you, Grace and Megan did a great job on Sunday morning. And, but you know where we were last week? We were at my oldest son, Zach's widow's wedding. She was getting married last week, right? It's a celebration of healing. Difficult, but a celebration of healing. In fact, you know, you know, Julia, my, my granddaughter, you know, has been a powerful gift of God's healing in our lives, right? In fact, we've got her now. We've got her for, we've got her until next Thursday because uh, her, you know, you know, mom and, mom, mom and, 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 and Steve are in New Zealand honeymooning, right? So we've got her. So I was sitting with her on the couch before I came over, you know. And, but um, she's been a tremendous gift of God's healing. But, you know, when they get back next Thursday, then they bundle up little Julia. And for the first time in two years of her life, she moves to Westchester to live. And I know everybody goes, oh, Westchester's not that far away. Well, it's a lot farther than she's lived the last two years, you know. But, you know, I, I, that little Julia, I'm going to tell you I love her. And I know this illustration can fall short in a lot of different ways. But, but that little Julia, I love her. In fact, I love her so much, it's, it's really, it's rare for me to say no to her. Like, man, I struggle saying no to her. And, and you know, when I do it, I have to muster everything within me because I, right, because I'm trying to protect her or I'm, or I'm trying to do what's best for her. Or I'm trying to do what her Nana told me to do, you know. But I mean, it takes all of my strength not to like just say yes to her all the time. In fact, she'll ask me, I'll be watching the morning news, you know, and she'll wake up, and when she comes down, she's like, Pappy, watch Mickey Mouse? And I'm like, all right. We turn it to Mickey Mouse. Pappy, build block tower? And then I build these towers, you know, these cardboard boxes, and then she kicks it over, and she goes, Pappy, try again? <laughs> I'm like, I can't build a tower she can't knock over. You know, she's so incredible. Pappy, marshmallow, please. I get in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble over that. In fact, one of the things that's, that, that, that's funny, one of the things that's funny about it is, you know, right before the wedding, Julia asked her mom for something, and, and her mom, Rachel, says, no, Julia, you can't have that. You're spoiling spoiler supper. And she looked at her and said, ask Pappy. <laughs> and man, did I get in a lot of trouble. You, you know what I'm hoping for? I'm just hoping somehow Dora doesn't quite figure this out and start to teach Julia to say, Pappy, vacuum, please. <laughs> Pappy, take out the garbage, please. I mean, I mean, here's the truth. Isn't this true? Man, when we love, it's hard to say no. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Paul is saying, look, the Spirit has uniquely designed you. Love. Love. Because if you love God, you won't say no. Man, it will be in your heartbeat to say yes if you love. All right, our theme verse, right? I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who's more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I baptize you with Water 
but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Love. Jesus, I thank you for the reality that uh, we love because you first loved us. I thank you for the truth that, uh, that it's your love that, uh, that calls us to repentance. Your word teaches us that. And it is your love that motivates us to say, yes, God, whatever it is that you ask. You've equipped me, you've molded me, you've formed me. Yes, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In response to your goodness and your grace, receive what it is that we bring. Know that we bring it out of hearts that desire to be obedient to you, to share your love, to transform our world. So Lord, receive freely as you've freely given and freely received. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your name.